Has Christianity always been one of the religions in the world to you? Oh, hallelujah. Christianity is not a religion. Neither is it a joining of a church and doing the Christian things like praying and giving and so on. Hallelujah. Christianity is the outworking of God's own kind of life received into the spirit of a man. Whoa! This divine life in the heart of a man makes him righteous, keeps him healthy, divinely guarded in life, prosperous and victorious. It gives you the ability to enjoy intimate fellowship with the Father and have dominion on this earth. Hallelujah! This is what awaits you if you will wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is the Son of God raised from the dead and personally confess him as the Lord of your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Join Dr. David Binden on the Good Life Devotion every Monday to Friday on this channel and receive truth that will usher you into the Good Life experience. Wow, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once again, it's with such joy that I welcome you to today's special episode of your favorite Good Life Devotion. If you are new to the Good Life Devotion, the Good Life Devotion is a daily devotional teaching of the truth of the Bible with the aim of bringing God's sons and daughters all around the world to a state of maturity where we can effectively display and demonstrate our divine nature on this earth to one, bring glory to the Lord, because that is his purpose for us, and to make our world a better place. Increasingly, according to the predictions of the scriptures, the world is becoming more perilous, and men are becoming more troubled. But in the midst of all these troubles of the world, God has already made a way for you to live and enjoy the fullness of God. And the access, the key into that arena is the truth of God's word. And because God wants us to have this word on a daily basis, he has enabled us to put it on many media platforms, television, radio, and internet platforms at different times of the day. So that depending on your pattern of life, you can choose a platform that best suits you and remain consistent in your following. It's very important to be consistent because sometimes you hear us for the first time and what you are hearing may not be... Um, what you are used to hearing. But when you keep being consistent and cross-checking with your word, you realize that this indeed is truth. And consistency also helps you to be able to uh, grow and enlighten yourself much more, even as we look at this week. The Lord can touch you to be part of those who are making it happen, and it is easy to get that done. Begin by praying wherever you are. Make sure you recommend it to everyone within your scope of influence and ensure also that you give to get it to other media platforms that we are not yet on. What we often do is to take a topic a week and dissect that topic from various perspectives. And this is going to be another week where we're going to be looking at the subject of um, God's word dwelling in you. You know, having God's word dwelling richly in you. We're going to be looking at this subject from various perspectives. What it is, why it should be so, and how we can ensure that the word of God settles and dwells richly in us according to the instructions of uh, the Bible. So that's what we're going to be looking at this week, and we want to share a word of prayer before we start off. Eternal and everlasting Father, we are very excited because we know that which your word is to us. We avail ourselves and open up our spiritual portals to receive of the life and spirit of your word. And Father, I pronounce that these words are producing amazing divine results, transforming lives in everyone's life in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are starting off today as we look at the subject of the word of God dwelling richly in us by looking at the topic, let the word dwell in you richly. Let the word dwell in you richly. And our main scripture is the book of Colossians chapter 3. We are looking at the 16th verse. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. And it says that, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 
And I want to add verse 17 because it follows so sweetly. It says, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Hallelujah. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wow. You know, sometimes you just read the word, and because of the spiritual nature of the word, just reading it, it it's so enjoyable. I pray for you that you will mature to a place where the reading of the word is not boring, but it inspires you to read more and more. Praise God. Now, just digging a little bit around the same verse. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Looking at that tells you that this verse of scripture is an instruction in righteousness. So when you read a word like this, it means that God is telling you that I have done what I need to do. I have done what I need to do. It is left to you to do something. That means that God is saying that I have already given you the word of Christ. Now it is your responsibility to ensure that this word of Christ dwells in you richly. Oh my God. That means that if you happen to be a son or daughter of God in whose life the word of God does not dwell richly, you cannot blame the Holy Ghost. You cannot blame the Lord Jesus. You cannot blame the Father for that. For instance, the Lord has invested so much in you by investing in us giving us the opportunity to capture these words, giving us the financial ability to transmit them to you, and you also to just sit in your room or somewhere and just watch. So God has done all he needs to do to get you the word. Question is, what must you do to this word? He says, let this word dwell in you richly. So this is one of the instructions in righteousness that is in the scripture. There are things in the scripture that inspire us, that inform us, that educate us, that build up, and that also things that instruct us, that things that rebuke, things that correct. This is one of such instructions. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know, because of the dimensions we are going to go on this subject, I want to take time to dig further in the same verse. When talking about let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, the first thing is, is an instruction. The second thing is, What's the meaning of the word dwelling in you? What's the meaning of the word dwelling in you? You know, I used to have a, a colleague in a medical school who he had the opportunity of being raised in a Christian home and had a very godly parents and he started memorizing scriptures as a child. And he could quote scriptures left and right, you know. But just having scriptures in your head because you memorize them and you can quote them off head is not the same as the word dwelling in you. There are people that once they've been around Christianity for some time and they know a few things here and there, they take off anything that they know the Bible. I remember um, earlier when we just received crowd, that was around the uh, middle 90s, you know, and we had this uh, person around our house who had been to uh, school and he, I think they had finished the sixth form by then and he did what they call BK in school. It's called Bible knowledge. And while we were passionate for God and going to church and all that, he would come and tell us, oh, we don't know this religion thing. We went to this form and he did uh, BK, Bible knowledge. So these things we are doing, he knows them, you know. And he was making our, our faith in God something like a place. I see we don't know what we are doing. You know, it's like people don't want to go to school and study religious or moral studies. So he comes home thinking that the few scriptures that have been used to make a combination of religions in school is a knowledge of the Bible. No. No, this is not the word of God dwelling in you richly. In fact, I was amazed to notice in my study of the word that the word dwell here is not the usual word used for abide and remain that is used in other places. It's the word en oq, and it means to inhabit. You understand? To inoccupy. To inoccupy. And the import of the word used here is like how a family occupies a house. When a family moves in to occupy a house, they don't stand at one place all the time. They begin to use the house. 
they use the washroom, they use the kitchen, you know, they use the bedroom, they use the every place. They, there's an activity of the one occupying the house in the house. So the usage of the word dwell here, it doesn't mean just having the word in you as a guest or the word in you as an idle thing. In other words, let the word of God not only be there, but be operative in you. A dwelling in which one functions as how somebody occupies a house. That's the meaning here. So if you have the word of God in your mind, or you just know something, the word is there, but that's not dwelling in you. The dwelling as used here means let it dwell and influence you. And it says, let this be richly done, not scantily. In other words, as a child of God, Boski, Branda, Hiku, Shatapa, let your life be suffused, pervaded, and moved at the frequency of the word of God. That's what it means. And it says, this is your responsibility. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. Then it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Glory to God. Singing with grace in your heart, Lord. If you read a verse like that, you can see the excitement in the life of the one in whose life God's word dwells richly. A lot of the dryness in people's lives, the depression, the anxiety, is simply as a result of emptiness of the word of God. Their lives are bereft of God's word. If you see a child of God who is not having the word theologically, he's not having the word mentally, but he has the word functionally and vitally, such a person can never be depressed. Depression in the life of a child of God is a sign of lack of the word of God abiding. The person may know it and quote it off head, but it has not yet gotten to a place where it is abiding, where it dwells and occupies and uses all the faculties of his life. <laughs> For the word of God to abide in you means that your thoughts are driven by the word. Your imaginations, your speech, your actions. Like if you take every department, every room of your life, your marriage, your finances, your education, your ministry, it is all pervaded by the word of God. I pray for you in the name of Jesus. May the grace of God to allow his word to dwell in you rest abundantly upon you. Especially even as you pay attention, as we teach you throughout the week, how you can bring yourself to this place where God's word does not just have a scanty appearance in you, but it actually dwells and influences you. So when this becomes your life, you are full of joy. You meet people. You know, one time a, a lovely sister of mine said that sometimes when things are challenging and she's talking to me and, um, you know, uh, quite bothered, then I seem to be calm as if nothing is happening. Then she's asking, does he really know what I'm talking about? You know, and we're, we're, we're discussing this and, you know, and the, the, the reason why, no matter what you're talking about, I can be calm is because, because of the richness of God's word, nothing moves me. There's always joy. And so now when you give, I give you a solution, it may look like it's too simple, but that's where the answer is. That's where the solution is. Why? When the word of God dwells in you, you are full of smiles. You are, you, your life is full of vigor. He says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. This is, it shows us how we should sing. You know, the singing ministry has really gone through a lot of metamorphosis to a place where it has become a, a, a concert or showmanship and all these things, just like every other ministry in the house of God. But proper singing is singing that is sung not to create a suitable rhythm for jumping and dancing. That is good. But most of the time, people sing just to amuse the tingling of their ears, something that is sweet to them, and they just dance, and they don't pay attention to the Lord. But real singing is singing in your heart to the Lord. And that, that singing in your heart does not mean being silent and, you know, sanctimonious. No, but you can shout and sing and do whatever. You can also be quiet, but whatever it is, it is a communion to the Lord. The same as our preaching must be preaching unto the Lord. Our singing must be singing unto the Lord. Our serving the house of God must be doing that unto the Lord. He says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And this can happen when the word of God dwells in you richly. So we just took some time to dig around the verse. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Teaching 
and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. We're going to continue along this line, but I'm going to go on a short one out of ten. We will continue to look at this important subject that the Holy Ghost is teaching us on. I'll be right back after this break. Hallelujah! That greatest revival that the scriptures, saints of old and saints of this time have prophesied about is finally at hand. Join Dr. David Binden and other sons and daughters of God all over the world on Revival Breeze as we pray to bring into physical manifestation that greatest move of the spirit that our Heavenly Father has orchestrated to hit the earth in our time. Join every Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT. Venue, Good Life Center 2, Collegono. Revival Breeze will be showcased live this and every Sunday at 4 p.m. on Metro TV, Accra, Touch TV Hope, Live TV, and Revival Breeze Channel YouTube and rebroadcast at 9 p.m. on OMI TV. Do not miss it. Life is good. Enjoy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we're talking about let the word of God dwell in you richly. And we just finished digging a little bit around Colossians 3.16 and we're about to continue. Now, like I said, this we're going to take our time looking at this subject from various perspectives as we do every week on the Glad Devotion. And um, as still a part of the foundation, we are going to go to how you can allow or cause the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. But before then, there is an attitude you must have towards God's word to be able to allow the word to dwell in you richly. You see, what it will require that I'll be sharing with you within the week to allow God's word to dwell in you richly must be something that is based on a certain attitude. If you don't even know what the word of God is, you will not desire it enough to allow it to dwell in you richly. If you don't understand what the word of God is, you will not even know why it is important to do what you ought to do to allow the word to dwell in you richly. So the first thing is an attitude towards God that will permit you to take the steps required to make God's word dwell in you richly. What is this attitude? The first aspect of that attitude is to know that God's words are life and their spirit. The spiritual and the living nature of God must become something that you don't just know, but something that is uh, a primary conviction in your spirit. As I speak now, I have a witness in my spirit. Says the Lord, if my people go beyond the letter of my word, then shall they see the power and the beauty of my word. Oh, glory. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. Wow. You know, look at what the Lord just told us. And what just happened is what we call a tongue and interpretation. For those who don't understand these things, in fact, I believe that probably early next year, we shall be coming to, to teach you a lot along that line. We've been doing that. But we need to know what these things are. The Lord just gave a tongue and interpreted it to us. It says that if his people shall go beyond the letter of the word to the Spirit, we will know the power and the beauty of the word. Wow. Father, we thank you for that. You know, so we're talking about getting to know that the word of God is life and it is spirit. The day it dawns on you that this Bible I'm holding is really God's word. And the words in it are not just letters written in a certain language. But these letters or these words that are printed are just the avenue, my God, of communicating to me living and vital substance from God. I'll give you an example. When the Bible says that we should lay hands on the sick to be healed, it is not the laying on of hands that is the issue. 
the hands being laid on the sick is an avenue for the virtue of God to penetrate the body of the person who is sick. That is why you can as well just speak the word. And you can even do other things apart from laying hands and the person will be healed. These are all just avenues. So what you have in the Bible is just the avenue by which God closes his word and brings it to you. That is why for those who take it as the letters, they don't get anything because they don't see that behind the letters or within the letters are the real things of God's word. God's word is, <laughs> God's word is a person. God's word is a light. God's word is quick. So you see it in John chapter 6, verse 63. He clarified it there for us. In John 6, 63, he said, oh boy, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are lie. It says, when you hear me talk, yes, you are hearing sounds, but the sound is the means of transmitting to you spirit. You may even watch the gestures that go with the sound on a video, but all these are means of bringing to you spiritual something and living something. The day it dawns on you that when your pastor is preaching, what he's saying is alive and it is true. That's why when you know that that person is of God. When it dawns on you, your attitude in church will change. The day it dawns on you that when I take my Bible, this is God transmitting to me living and active substances. You'll be amazed at the power of his word. You'll be amazed. Listen, Christianity is so simple. Oh, how I pray that we know some basics. This same Bible you are holding and the things you read about saints in the Old Testament, that God is still that alive today. If only the reality of his word will be that alive to you. You can talk about Moses, okay, doing a lot of miracles in Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and, and, and raining manna from heaven and then, you know, doing a lot of things. But where did it all begin? Moses was being trained in the greatest presidential palace on the earth. The Bible said that the word of God came to his heart. And he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. To Moses, God's word was not a suggestion. God's word was alive. He actually left the palace and went because he didn't understand the call. He made some mistakes, killed an Egyptian, and had to run away. He went to live in a lonely wilderness, taking care of someone else's animals, not his own animals. Can you imagine this, the, the dimension of stupidity? If somebody is thinking in the flesh, you said you had God to identify with Israelites, and so you left Egypt, you left Pharaoh's house, and you are not even living in a, a decent house. You are now a servant in another person's house when you had everything to yourself in, in Pharaoh's house. It, it didn't make sense. But Moses was acting this way because God's word was alive to him. That was why he could produce the things he did. So you read about David and Goliath and what David did as a king. When God's word comes to David, when David messed up and Nathan came and spoke, look at what David did. Anytime it was God's word, David behaved like it was 100%. But in today's world where God's word looks like a, a, another religious person's word, and there are all suggestions, and everybody has opinions, and people can even criticize the Bible, <laughs> and you know, he, he, or, or wonder whether it's Moses that wrote the tournament, because how can somebody write about his own, death? all these kind of things. If the word of God is this to you, you cannot have the results of the Bible. So you first must know have the right attitude to God's word. God's word is not a suggestion. God's word is not an opinion of man. God's word is not another thing to give us a code of ethics and a good moral life or social life. No, these are divine substances. Until this dawns on you, you cannot even go on the journey of getting God's word to dwell in you richly. Oh boy, our time is up. We're going to continue on the second aspect of this attitude in our next episode. If you have been watching us and you have not yet received Jesus, the life in Christ is so rich and so buoyant and so great. Many have played with it and made it social. And so they are missing out on the meat, the greatness of it. 
but it is still the same thing. A human must receive Jesus and be born again as a son of God and step into an amazing life in the kingdom of Christ. Where there are great things. How does that happen? You don't need to do anything. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And the Bible said that God was in him, reconciling the world without imputing their sins. So you don't need to go through a long list of confession of sins. The main thing is to know that Jesus died and took away those sins. Now he wants you to recognize his lordship and declare him lord of your life. If you do that, the rest, again, the Holy Ghost will do it. By taking the human life and giving you the life of God, you become born again. This is so simple. The Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart that God risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He showed you what to confess. The Lord Jesus. Do you want to do that today? Then say this after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you died to take away the sins of the world. And you were raised from the dead on the third day. Jesus, I declare you Lord of my life now. I receive eternal life into my spirit, and I declare that I am born again. If you've done that with all your heart, truly you're born again. We inspire you to ensure that you don't remain there just watching on TV or listening on radio, but get planted in a Bible teaching, practicing, and believing church, and remain in that fellowship. Soon, next year, we shall be bringing you a list of areas where you can join any of our New Creatures Fellowship if that's what you, the Lord has led you to do. But apart from that, there are good churches everywhere that you can join and be sure that you remain in Christ until he comes. Surely I'm going to come away again in our next episode as we look at this subject matter of letting the word of God dwell in us richly. But till then, life is good. Enjoy. Thank you for joining today's episode of your favorite Good Life Devotion with Dr. David Binder. The Good Life Devotion is proudly brought to you by friends and partners of the Final Global Movement. For more information on how to become a partner, call us on 055-792-7744 or log on to our website, finalglobalmovement.org. Become a partner today and contribute to the global spread of God's message for the now. Follow us on our various social media handles and you will be blessed. Don't miss the Good Life Devotion on the channels displayed on the screen at the scheduled times. Till we come your way with the next episode of the Good Life Devotion with Dr. David Bender. Life is good. Enjoy.